I was a hook fin. I'd rather been on a river bottom, swimming, fishing, or hunting. But my mother, a lot of the times, took me, or to say, dragged me to what we call the healing evangelist. From three years old up until I was 14. And I say drag because I didn't want to go. But I was raised in Pentecost. Back then they called us holiness. Now, some called us holy rollers. And I am a, my mother was a genuine, authentic, holy roller. Now, for three years, I would have classified me with the criminally insane. Now, before I came to California, 14 months before, I was homeless. And a family, well, a grandma and a grandson, was there in Oklahoma, and uh, the grandson didn't like Oklahoma too well. Oklahoma's a very friendly state. It's the most friendly state in the Union. Guys, but you didn't want to go to a pool hall and play pool and start smarting off about the house rules. It's also a place where you can quickly be fed a cute. Uh, one of those cue sticks. And after Teddy ate his second one, he decided he wanted to go back to California. Well, they invited me to go. Now, I didn't want to go. I liked Oklahoma. But an old friend came by and said, Tommy, the police talked to me. They've got a warrant for your arrest. They know that you're the leader of this burglary ring that's going around, breaking into houses and businesses. He said, they don't want us little gang members. They want you. I said, well, don't want to go. He said, well, you think this over because it's either Go to California with these people, or you're going to go to prison. You decide what you want to do. I didn't take long, not, not much thinking, that I decided California would be better. <laughs> and uh, so I went with them. They were from Venice Beach. Some of you know it's, it's better known as Muscle Beach. Does have beautiful white sand. Now, we stayed in an apartment house. I was there about two weeks. Now, Teddy was a year older than me and about 50 pounds heavier. But we both got to liking the same girl. And we got into a fight over her. I won the fight. But Teddy got the girl, and Grandma got mad at me, brought me in, sat me down, told me she liked me, but I, I was very mean to Teddy. I thought, what do you think you're trying to do to me? So she let me know she wanted me to leave. Well, here I am, homeless again, in an entirely different world, folks. Here's a country boy that thought I lived in an extremely big town of Chickasha, 14,000 people lived there. And I was scared senseless of Oklahoma City. Back in 1960, a quarter of a million people lived there. So here I'm going with these grandma and grandson. Here I am up here in the city of, I don't know how many million, in vicinity, at the time, 17 million. That means city against city against city. Well, I went up to Venice Beach and I sat down, pulled off my cowboy boots, 
started running my feet through the sand looking down at Venice Boulevard. And down at the apartment complex where we were at, I recognized one woman is the landlord. The other one I didn't know, but they were headed straight up Venice Boulevard, and I could see they were headed straight to me. So I knew what they were going to do. And I knew they were holiness. <laughs> well, they had buns that high. <laughs> See, back then, the Pentecostal people called themselves holiness. And the women were buns, and they thought the higher the bun, the more glorious they were. <laughs> and I'm not saying that making fun of them. They thought that. It was taught them. Well, I got in my con mood. Play along with them. Maybe they'll give you something to eat, even some money. Sure as I look, they walk right up to me. One on each side of me. The landlord sat down and held my hand. The other one started witnessing to me. Now, I don't believe anything is coincidental with God. He's got it all planned out. As I look back over the decades, I can see it so clearly. Both of these women, as young women in their teens, had attended the Azusa Street Revival. Yeah. Now, I knew about Azusa Street. Those, those old evangelists, healing evangelists, some of them would talk about it. And about this guy named Seymour, William Seymour. Well, when Sister Goldie asked me, did I want to give my heart to the Lord? No, I didn't. But I played along with her and said, sure. So I said the sinner's prayer with her. I wasn't that sincere. But after I said it, it's like a oven went off in my chest. And I sat there and I started shaking. I started crying. I looked over at Sister Goldie. And Sister Goldie is in my book. I, I, see, I was shocked. I was stunned. And I looked at her and I said, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and she says, yes. My thought is, God would save me? Well, they took me down to the landlord's apartment. I slept on her couch that night. And they did give me something to eat. But Sister Goldie came over the next day and took me on the bus they call it the trolley. We're up to a place called Pisgah, which was in Highland Park, right next to Pasadena, almost in the San Gabriel Mountains. We got off the bus at 60, Avenue 60 in Figueroa. Walked one block, and I'm looking at this place. And guys, it looked like a, a curtain hanging around it all together over a city square block. And I'm kind of apprehensive. I think, what is this stuff? When I got on the grounds, such a peace came over me. It was so peaceful there. Now, 87 people lived on the grounds. 21 of them were workers, and 66 of them rented apartments there. And then they worked well many of those people that rented were what we call Azusa Street Saints they had attended the Azusa Street Revival and now they've grown old and they're retired and they were coming to Pisgah so they could rent an apartment and still work for the Lord and still work the gifts well Sister Goldie introduced me to several of them Later on, Harold Smith, the pastor, he led me, he showed me the, the, the others. And I'm thinking, wow. Well, they, I noticed they keep walking around me uh, trying to get me to seek the Holy Ghost. I didn't want the tongue stuff. Besides that, the Holy Ghost He'd always rat on me to my mama. 
I couldn't do anything and get away with it. That woman would, I'd walk in the door, and you went out and did so and so, didn't you? How you know? She's the Holy Ghost told me, because I made the mistake once, only once. I said to my dear beloved mother, well, you know what I think of the Holy Ghost? She turned and put her hands on her hip, looked down at me and says, I'm six years old, guys. She says, what do you think of the Holy Ghost? I said, I think he's a rat beak. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I only got six whippings from my mother in my life. I got about that many a month from my dad. That was the, oh, that was bad. I shouldn't have said that. My mother even take me to church and had him pray for me. She thought I'd blaspheme the Holy Ghost and couldn't be saved. Even though God had told her when I was still in her womb that I'd going to be a preacher man someday. Of course, they told her, Jimmy, he's not old enough to even know how to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Now, here I am at, at this place called Pisgah. Now, Pisgah, they named it after the Bible, in the Bible, the mountain that Moses stood on and viewed the promised land was called Pisgah. They now call it Nebo. I like Pisgah better. Now, I kept telling these people, I don't want the tongue thing. That mean I have the Holy Ghost and he'd probably tell on me. I'm 17 years old. Stood six foot two and weighed 121 pounds. I thought I was big, but I wasn't. I was, I was pretty slim for six foot two. Now, I'm not that now. I've shrunk some, guys. <laughs> and you younger ones, it's okay to laugh, but someday you will too. <laughs> if you last that long, because I'm going to tell you something. That hundred-year prophecy was made by three of the generals of the faith. You're talking about William Seymour, Charles Parham, and Mary Woodworth Eder. All made the same prophecy at approximately the same time. That in about a hundred years, there would be another revival like Azusa Street. This time, with, with the return of Shekinah glory, Shekinah glory, but this time it would not be in one place or with one person. It's going to be all over the world. And guys, it has been breaking loose all over the world. Now that prophecy was made in November of 1909. And it's breaking loose. And uh, does everybody accept it? No. I've had a lot of people say, I don't want that spooky stuff. They're talking about a substance that was at Azusa Street it floated around all the time at about one foot high called Shekinah Glory. It's kind of a, a fog-like thing. The one there, kind of like it's kind of amber, kind of like there's flames in it. Lucille would lay down in it sometimes for hours and, and, and breathe it. Of course, there's times that thing would rise and fill the whole building and everybody had to breathe it. Now, I'm a storyteller. I like to tell stories, and I like to listen to them. I'm from Oklahoma. I'm a little over a quarter Cherokee. And we have keepers. That's what our family called them. They're people that, that, that can remember and retell a story in detail. Now, and they, we keep the history of the tribe and of our family. I became one at the age of three on both sides of my family. Now, I, uh, 
like I say, nothing's coincidental. There's a reason that I was a storyteller. Well, Sister Laura Laintroff came to me one day and says, Tommy, uh, there's something I would like for you to do if you, if you think you're man enough. Now, she's saying this to a cocky 17-year-old kid. I said, well, but, but, but what is it? She said, I'd like for you to read the entire chapter of the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations. I told her I'd do it. I sat down that afternoon and read it. Scared me senseless. All these things stinging you, falling on you, and you couldn't die. But I noticed in there it said they wouldn't bother you if you had the mark of God in your forehead. Well, I went to Laura quickly that evening. I said, how do you get the mark of God in your forehead? And she smiled real sweetly. She said, when you get that tongue thing. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true or not, but she said it. That was it. I wanted the tongue thing. <laughs> so within a, a few days, I get with a man, and he asked me, did I want it? And I said, is that that tongue? You, you, you're talking about the tongue thing. He laughed and said, yes. I said, I want it. I want it right now. I got it. Yeah. That was such a relief. <laughs> but after I received the baptism, several of the, what they call us, the Street Saints came to me and says, Tommy, we believe God is showing us that you are the one we're to tell our stories to. I said, oh, okay. Not game. I love stories. Now, if you say, well, what? If you don't know, Jesus, when he spoke to the people, he only spoke to them in parables. Go check out what a parable is. It's a story. Now, I, uh, I said, sure, I love stories. And they said, well, okay. Now, is there anything you'd like to eat or drink? I said, well, I do kind of like chocolate chip cookies and cold milk. You know, I was raised on cold milk or cool milk, not cold. We had our own cows and our own goats. So I started, I went to each one of them once a month. And he got several of them there. And I'd sit at their feet out of respect and listen to those stories. <clears throat> each and every one of them when I'd go it's as though I'd sit there as though I'd never heard it before and listen for six years from 17 to 23 now I uh, I got captivated this glory stuff. I, I, I want to see some of that stuff. Yeah. 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 And then I got captivated by the man Seymour. Now Seymour wasn't that educated, but very brilliant, very good speaker. But he had one thing, he was very humble, see. And when Seymour would come down from his apartment overhead, He'd sit down on the pew and put a box on his head. He did that three times a day. Now the meeting went on 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three and a half years. He'd leave the box on his head, maybe 10 minutes, maybe over an hour until God told him to take it off. Then when he'd take it off, things happened. But before he came down, and while the box is on his head, kids as young as six years old were going up to people in wheelchairs and getting them healed. 
There were some older people there, but you got to remember, I didn't meet any of them. They were older already. In the time I got there in 1960, they're dead. I met the young ones that told me their stories. Now, I found out later that many people tried to get them to tell the stories. They wouldn't tell them to them. I mean, Tommy Hicks, Demis Shakarian, Harold Bredesen, David Duplessis. And not until after they had told me their stories. Now, these people, being around, I, should, I never seen them get sick but once. They didn't get sick. And the first story I got captivated by, Sister Carney, you'd fall in love with her. She, she, she wore these hook and eye boots. And sure, she had her little glory bun. And she wore flowered dresses, you know, kind of, you may not know what, but you older people do. They used to get flour in a hundred pound sack, and it was a beautiful flowery sack made of cotton. And when they emptied them, then they'd take those, that, that material and make clothes out of them. Well, us guys didn't want them flowery clothes, and, you know. But the women made beautiful dresses and blouses out of them. She was so full of, of, of information. But I think I might should give you a little bit of history about how Azusa came around. Uh, Frank Barlowman was having prayer groups for over two years. William Seymour got a letter asking him would he come to L.A. and pastor a church. Well, he agreed, and he, and he came to, he came to uh, Los Angeles from Houston, Texas, where he had been listening to Charles Parham. Of course, he had to sit out in the aisle and listen to a crack in the door. An usher would leave a door crack so he could hear what was going on. Uh, back then, they had the Jim Crow law. And uh, in, in, in Houston, Texas, they honored it. But in Los Angeles, California, they didn't. And if you don't know what the Grim Crow Law is, only, you could only come to church and worship with the same color. If you came in and mixed, the authorities would come down and arrest you and arrest the pastor for letting you come in. Seymour came there. He preached Sunday morning. He went back to preach that night, and there was a padlock on the door and a note saying that he was fired. Well, a man walked up and said, William, I knew this, going to do this. His name was Ashbury. He said, I've got a house over on Bonnybury Street. You can come over and preach over there. He said, well, okay, you know, what other choice do you have? So he went. And that's really where the revival started. Now, not the Shekinah glory, not as many, but the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Fell there, and people started receiving the baptism. And even the fire department was called down to see what was wrong with them. And they kept telling them, they're just falling out of the spirit. Leave them alone. So the fire department left them alone. But now that thing got so strong and so powerful that a block away up on Beverly Boulevard, which was a big street in L.A., innocent people were walking across the street and would fall out down in the street speaking in tongues. And the horses wouldn't step over the bodies. So it was causing traffic jams. So the, that's when the authorities went to Seymour and let him know, you're going to have to either shut it down 
or we'll shut you down or get a building big enough to, you know, a church or, or, or an auditorium to hold the crowds. <clears throat> well, he had been eyeing this old warehouse on Zusa Street. It's originally built as a Methodist church. The only problem he had, he didn't have the money. He said, God, what am I going to do? But just what do I do? And God told him, after the service this evening, get on the trolley car and go to Pasadena and get off where I showed you to get off. He said, all right, Lord. Now, now you know there's a sundown law in Pasadena. Now, if some of you are uneducated enough to know what a sundown law is, it's before sundown, if you're not white, you had to be out of the city. He said, but at your word, I'll go. So he did. Now, in Pasadena, Sister Carney in Pisgah had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1904. One of the members in 1903 had gone to Topeka, Kansas, to Bethel School with Charles Parham, and had received the baptism and come back in 1904 in the summertime for summer break. Introduced it to Pisgah, and Joachim received it, and uh, then they introduced it to the congregation, and they received it. One of them there was a young lady by the name of Carney. Well, Sister Carney went to her friends in Pasadena at the First Baptist Church, and they got filled. And uh, that didn't fit in with Baptist doctrine, so they got the left foot of fellowship. <laughs> so Frank Barleman talked her into starting a prayer group in Pasadena. So she did. Now, on Colorado Boulevard. Now, if, you, if any of you have ever been to Pasadena, I've been on Colorado Boulevard, these are monstrous mansions. They look like castles. Well, Seymour was going over there, and God told him to pull, he pulled the cord. He got off. And looking around, really, here's these mansions. Second house he walked by, he says, go up and knock, ring the, you know, knock on the door. And back then in 06, there wasn't very many doorbells. You had a little metal deal there, you bang, bang, bang. Well, that's what he went up there and rapped. Well, they'd been in there praying, and they'd been praying for over two years. Well, Sister Carney went to the door with the lady of the house. She said there's 15 people there, 12 women and three men. They opened the door and they're startled. Here's this black man standing there at 1030 at night, blind in one eye. The lady of the house says, can I help you? He said, looked her right in the face and said, you're praying for revival, right? She said, yes. He said, I'm the man God has sent to preach that revival. They invited him in, talked a little bit, and have him preach. Then they took up an offering, which was well more than what they needed to rent the Sousa Street warehouse. You've got to remember, all these people were rich people. They had the money. See, God knows what he's doing. Well, then Seymour went back to L.A., rented the building. Then the people from Bonnie Bray. Now, Bonnie Bray, they were Orientals, American Indians, Hispanics or Mexican, and black. There was only one white person there, and that was Frank Barlaman. Well, all the people in Pasadena were white. Well, they came together and cleaned up the church, and that became the first totally integrated church in America. <laughs> Seymour would not put up with segregation. He caught more than 20 in one group. 
of the same color, he split them up. <laughs> but there, there at Azusa is where this Shekinah glory started floating in. Miracles galore were going on. But now, every now and then, Seymour would get that box off his head and get up and start walking around and finally he'd say, Charles, play this tune. And usually it was the, the tune was, the comforter has come. He'd start playing it. He says, this Shekinah glory then would start rising. Well, no, first, Seymour would say, now everybody, you start singing in the Spirit. And some of you don't know that's singing in tongues. When they started singing in tongues, the Shekinah glory would start rising. It filled the whole building and it spilled over on the outside. And pretty soon, a flame would shoot up out of the roof. Go about 50 foot high. Then about 50 foot from that, a ball of fire would appear. And flames would come down out of that ball of fire and go through the fire coming up. Sion said when he was playing, he'd stop and just watch his hands. No, he didn't take his hands away, but he wasn't playing it. He was watching. Something else was moving. And he said that was just, and it sounded like a thousand pianos playing. Brother Christopher would be playing the violin, and he says, we're talking about, but still, all of a sudden I stop and I'm looking. I'm not moving my arms. He says, and it sounded like a thousand violins. And the people would swear they were hearing the same thing. And that's when the big miracles would start happening. And, uh, but now, as far as the power of God falling, it got so far away at Azusa Street that down on Union Station, they had this big wooden platform. People were coming from all over the world. Well, they were landing in boats. They weren't landing in planes back then, folks, in 1906. They came in on trains or buses from the docks. They were getting off on the platform, and David Garcia walked right by it every, every time he went to, he came by one afternoon, and there was bodies scattered all over the platform. He thought a disaster had happened. <laughs> he went up, he's looking at him, he looked at some of the workers over there, and he says, we don't know what's happening. They get off and then they fall down on the ground and start jabbering something. <laughs> but they were speaking in tongues. Yeah. Well, he ran to Azusa Street and he could get and got a hold of Frank Barlaman and got him to come down. Practically dragging him down there. And they finally go down. He says, they just got the Holy Ghost. He says, yeah, Frank, but what do we do? He says, let's get them up. And point them towards Azusa. He said, there was a long line. He said, get them up, talk to them, and send them out. A half a mile away, guys. That's how much the power of God was there at that place. Now, Ralph Riggs was 11 years old when he started going to Azusa. Now, he's one of the founding fathers of this symbol of God. His mother took him. She probably dragged him, but my mother did. But him and his friend, C.W. Ward, got to watching people. So they started going up and praying for, and people were getting healed. Now, he prayed for one man. He wasn't going to pray for him at first. The man came in off of Skid Row. Dog drunk, stunk of alcohol. Ralph Riggs asked him, says, would you like me to pray for you? He says, well, I heard things like that was happening. That's what I came down here for. Riggs started noticing the man was blind. Couldn't see a thing. That's why he came in feeling. 
So Riggs had a little bit of compassion and went over and prayed for him. This guy stood about six foot four. He got instantly healed. And the stench of alcohol left him. Now, Ralph told me that later on in the Midwest, he got to know this man and he got with the Assemblies of God and he established many Assembly of God churches in the Midwest. One of them was on 5th in Omaha in Chickasha, Oklahoma. I've gone to the church. It's not there anymore. They've gotten so big they've moved over in the south part of town at a much bigger church. Now, nothing coincidental. One of the stories I love is Brother Fox, who became a missionary for over 50 years in India. They brought in this, he had this one deaf man. So when he was praying for him, he says, now say something. The man says, I can't talk. <laughs> and Fox says, say that again? <laughs> and the man finally dawned on him, he was talking. Well, him and Fox had a shouting good time. Now, folks, they shouted like crazy at Azusa. Some ran, some jumped, some danced. And some of the miracles I'm going to tell you, you'll understand why some of them were getting really wild. Now, today, tongues is pretty well accepted. It's just almost 700 million people speaking tongues in the world today. But most of them don't want that spooky stuff. And they don't want the fire. Okay, then they don't have to worry. They won't get it. <laughs> but listen, when Seymour had this saying this stuff and this stuff, I asked Brother Signs, what's the greatest miracle you've seen with Seymour? Now, a lot of the others told me the same thing. But he said, Tommy, he said, this man worked for, in the railroad yards. And he got his leg crushed and amputated it. Well, it was getting gangrene with sores where the stub went down into the, that part of the wooden leg. And we want to see more to pray for the gangrene. Seymour's looking at him. He says, well, yeah, God take care of that. But he says, look, I, I'm kind of a little aggro. Just get this wooden stub here off. Called some men over and they held it, took it off. And the man balanced on one leg and still more prayed for him. He said, Tommy, it was right here, but he says, Tommy, go tch, 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 tch. And all of a sudden, a foot shot out. Come on. Now, Seymour did not preach that night. It took him to two o'clock to finally get that brother to settle down. <laughs> I asked Brother Sides, I said, What did you do? He said, I don't know, but I know I came to in the back of the church and have no idea how I got there. He says, when you go berserk, you say, I said, yeah. yeah. I'd shout too, guys. Yeah. Then the second biggest one was with Brother Garcia, David. He said, Brother Tommy, I can look right down into this thing. A man had got his arm and his shoulder ripped off at a job. Ten years earlier. Well, they've been giving him trouble. Of course, he was getting worse and worse. He could still work with one arm, but they barely gave him any money. He couldn't do much. He wanted his old job back. And uh, Steve Moore said, folks, y'all want to have some fun tonight? He says, you remember that leg that grew out a year ago? Oh, yeah, he says, told that man, he says, uh, listen to me. If God give you a new arm and you got your old job back, he says, would you pay tithes? 
The man said, yeah, yeah. He, he went to laugh and said, I'm just having fun with Jesus. That's between you and God. Now, I'm a firm believer in tithing. According to the Word of God, tithes is not yours. It belongs to God. That's all God's asking for you, 10%. They said, do you pay them? Yeah. And at least that much more in offerings. Even when I didn't have a job. Now, he said, okay, let's get this. He had kind of like a mannequin arm hanging down there. Didn't look so bad, you know. Just get this off. They got it off. He says, Tommy, he said, he, he laid his hand on that man's shoulder, close to the middle of his back, started praying. He said, I'm looking down in it. And he says, the bone started growing out wow. about four inches, and then it kept growing. But behind it, flesh started growing around the bone. And it went on out. He said, I even watched the fingernails grow on. He says, again, Seymour didn't preach. That man went berserk. I would have too. But Sister Carney, that sweet little old lady, I, the first thing I'd ask them, if though I'd never heard it before, what's the greatest miracle you remember that you saw in your ministry there at Azusa Street? And hers was the lady that she had She'd come into the place with a big cloth on her head, holding it. You could see she was in tremendous pain. So she, Sister Carney went up to her and says, can I help you any? So she told her what was wrong. The night before, she had caught her husband with another woman. And the wife and the woman got into a fight, and the other woman bit the wife's ear off. So Sister Carney raised it up and looked. And she said, Brother Tommy, there was no ear there, just like a bloody piece of meat. So Sister Carney put the cloth back down and started praying for her. Then all of a sudden the woman says, oh, the pain's gone. It's tingling. Something's happening. So Sister Carney raised it back up and looked. And she says, Tommy, right before my eyes, an ear grew out. Yeah. Now, she didn't get a, I said, what would you do? She says, I stood with my mouth and said, oh, my God. Yeah. It was such a shock to her. At first, she didn't know what to do. And now, this next one of Sister Carney, I got to meet him. His name was Aubrey Lee. He became a four-square pastor. His ministry was called Sky Pilot Program. He had a very famous choir leader, uh, songwriter as his choir leader. Her name was Doris Akers. She wrote two very famous songs in Christianity, such as Walking Up the King's Highway, and There's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit in This Place. Aubrey from a very little kid on up, was paraplegic. He, he, he couldn't walk. And he wore these giant braces to when he could get st stood up, he could stand. Well, Sister Carney went over and she established the Carney rule. You go to pray for someone at a wheelchair, you first gently pick up their legs and pull that flap up and put their feet back down on the ground. Because when you're going to pray for them, they're going to get healed. That's right. Now, it got to where they didn't come up and say, I believe God will heal you. No, no. They'd walk up and say, God is going to heal you tonight. Yes. And at Azusa Street, they got healed. Yeah. She prayed for Aubrey Lee. And she looked at him and said, get up and walk. He said, I can't. These braces are too heavy. She said, oh, you men, come over. Take these braces off his leg. They did. She said, now, get up and walk. He got up and walked. Yeah. That church was one of the first mega churches 
in Pentecost in L.A. with Brother Aubrey Lee. Now, the man with the arm, he went back, got his old job back. In less than two months, that plan of over 200 people had come to Azusa and been saved and filled, including the owner. How'd you like that, guys, working at a plant? Everybody, including your boss, was your brother. Be nice, huh? Now, Hollywood Presbyterian Church had a lot of Hollywood stars going to it. When I was there, they had about 7,000 members. Back then, I don't know how many they had, but it's, it's a large church back then. A man came in with crippled hands, crippling arthritis. He, he once played the piano there. It was big enough they paid the musicians. And, of course, he had lost his job. He couldn't play anymore. He came in to science, and he says they wanted his old job back. Science said, what well, Judy told him, he says, get over there and start playing. He said, I can't. He said, sit down on the stool. He sat down. He put your hands up on the keys. He did. Science laid his hands on him, prayed for him. For example, he says, start playing. Well, the guy started, and all of a sudden, it's pop, 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 pop. He went and got his old job back. Now, some of the other people that I got to see that was healed in the stories, Mother Mangwin prayed for a woman whose legs had been crushed. Naughty, just naughty, you know, with the bones and never reset. She couldn't, she walked, scooted on the ground. With her. They got her in there and Mother Mangwin prayed for her and her legs got healed. She even for many, many years ran a, uh, a little house where prostitutes that got pregnant, instead of aborting them, they'd come there and, and she would get with adoption agencies and adopt them out for years. She was almost 100 years old when I got there in 1960. And I told Mother Mangrum, I want to see those legs. Well, sure, she went over. But well, that old lady did not want to show this man her legs. <laughs> With some convincing from Mother Mangrum, I got to see this much down. I went into shock. She was almost 100. The rest of her body was wrinkled. Those legs looked like a very young woman's. <laughs> Betty Grable didn't have anything on her. I turned and looked at her and said, my God. I said, these are the legs. She said, these are the legs. Still just like they were when they got healed. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> then the other that I remember so strong was Brother Anderson, Tommy Anderson. Now, Brother Anderson, two things were weird about him. One, I believe he was kin to the kangaroos. <laughs> he walked. He took long steps. And you seen him a distance away, he was up and down, up and down, like he was bouncing like a kangaroo. Well, at Azusa Street, if he wasn't praying for somebody, he wasn't at 15 when Azusa started, he'd get up on a pew and watch others work miracles. Well, he's standing on this pew. When this woman came in, now I got to meet this woman, Sister Diane. She's the first woman, first person to call the fire department to report that that old warehouse was on fire when the flames were shooting out. They came down. Now they came down several times and finally got to work and they called them and say, that old warehouse is on fire. They says, no, it's not. It's called Shekinah Glory. Stop calling us. 
Now, the doctors had finally told her they wouldn't operate on this tumor about, well, she had to, when she walked, she had to hold it in her hand because it was so painful that thing would bounce up and down. It wouldn't operate and it was killing her. It was cancer. She thought, well, you can sit here and die. And if you go down to that warehouse and you die, so what? But you might get one of them miracles down there. She said, Tommy, I got one kid in one, my right arm and my left hand, and she carried the big tumor. And the other two kids walked beside her. She said, I waddled myself down there, and when I came in, Tommy Anderson saw her and leaped off the pew and landed right beside her. And looked her in the face and said, God's going to heal you tonight. She said, I walled my eyes in the back of my head and says, that's what I came here for. <laughs> they laid hands on her, and she says, Tommy, you could feel that tumor just. And within seconds, it was gone. Now, in either 1914 or 1915, God told her to start a soup kitchen on Skid Row. She got in her little pocket, got her little Got her only coin. She said, God, all I've got is 25 cents this quarter. And God told her, that is sufficient. She went to farmer's market and bought a quarter's worth of vegetables. Now, back in 1914 or 15, you could buy quite a few vegetables for a quarter. She took it home, made a stew, went down to Skid Row, and served it. When I met her, she had been honored by the city mayor county commissioners, and the governor of California. She was serving 10 meals a day, 5,000 at a time. Guys, if you can't cipher numbers, that's 50,000 meals a day. I met a lot of people that got saved at her little soup kitchen. <clears throat> now that's testimony but I, I have one favorite that I always tell about Lucille Lucille stood 4 foot 10 she claimed to weigh 92 pounds I doubt it <clears throat> I doubt if she was that heavy Very attractive woman for her age. When I met her, she was 69 years old. Lucille was very wealthy, but not then. She was comfortable. Later on, she got wealthy. But Lucille, and she became the secretary to Amy Stimple McPherson. She'd play games with the little gifts she had. She liked praying for teeth. She'd bring handkerchiefs with her to the meetings in case it has some bad stuff down in there because she likes sticking her finger in their mouth. And one by one, put her finger on the tooth, where a, on the gum where a tooth should be, and command it to grow out, and it push hard so that the new tooth could push her finger up. And there's many full mouths. She did them one at a time. A lot of them were getting on to her. You could do a lot more. She says, this is between me and God. Leave me alone. <laughs> they left her alone. She might have been little, but she's like a little banny hen. I know. She's bossy, domineering, because she was Harold Smith's secretary at Pisgah. Because Amy had died, she took over with Jean Darnell, but when Harold Smith came to Pisgah in 1950, she went to work for him. She didn't want the little $25 a month they gave her, but Harold Smith said, if you won't take the $25 a month, then go. She said, but I pay many times more than that, and Ty said, I don't care. He said, so do I. 
which is we all get 25 a month in complete room and board. Now, I got a lot more than that, folks. Those old people spoiled me rotten, and I loved it. They bought me clothes, Bibles, gave me money. Sister Goldie even introduced ever to ever. This is my son, Tommy. I just stand there smiling and not say anything. I, was, <laughs> I guess she missed spiritual son. She would come from Venice Beach once a month. On the 15th, we had fellowship meeting, and she'd tell me her stories then. Of course, after a while, I'm the one sitting at the front eating my cookies and drinking my milk, but she'd have an audience because they were getting there to, you know, for the, for the meeting. They'd listen to them too. Now, Sister Goldley, when she came to Azusa Street, brought a, a, a dustpan and a little towel. She prayed for tumors. And when one fall off, she, she didn't want just laying there on the floor. <laughs> so she'd get it and put it in the dustpan and then go out and throw it in the trash. I said, just go to hell did you do that. She says, oh, sometimes I've had as many as three dustpans full of tumors. I thought, my lands. And some, some say, when did the revival end? And oh, tell me the same story. All of a sudden, Seymour quit putting the box on his head. And within two weeks, the Shekinah glory was gone. People still get, getting the baptism, but the miracles started going. He wouldn't tell anyone why. If God's doing, now I don't know. God might have told him to, folks. I don't know. But I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready for that Shekinah glory. I'm ready for that fire. Now I've been at. I was at. A, I was at a prayer conference with Billy Brim once. And I was praying with uh, Lynn Hamill, or Hamlin, Dino, the piano player, and, 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 and Terry, Kenneth Copeland's oldest daughter. I drive says, Billy, they can do what they want, but God told me to, everybody comes by to yell, fire, fall. She says, okay. The other says, yeah. So we all, when the people were coming down, we were just yelling, Fire fall, and people were getting healed, delivered. Now, I want anything God's got in any way He has it. God's not going to get our permission on how to do this thing. If something starts falling in here, don't fight it. I remember I got a call from a lady up close to Washington, D.C. She was at a Randy Clark meeting. The glory was falling, folks. And this time, there were some sparklets in it, like little gems, tiny gems. She said, Tommy, could it, you think that, is that of God or could that be of the devil? I said, well, I don't know. I says, anybody getting healed? Yes. Anybody getting saved? Yes. I said, well, that's not the devil. I said, my wife was getting mad at me. I was talking on the phone. I said, listen to me. The devil's not going to heal somebody, and he's definitely not going to save somebody. I said, if it's working, leave it alone. It must be God. She says, oh, I says, is Randy concerned? She says, no, just me. I says, oh, good. I was getting worried that Brother Randy was. <laughs> I love Randy Clark. He, when he had me, he interviewed me once for about 45 minutes. And he still got the interview, and he showed it over the Internet. I said, Randy, do you ever question God? He says, no, but sometimes I argue with him. But I do, too. It's not good, folks. I've gotten into some trouble. 
I really have. But, but, but if I don't quite, God's going to explain to Brother Kenneth E. Hagin has argued with God. Like when I went to Seymour's grave. And God told me to go. And I finally got Kevin Richardson and Dana Roman to take me. And I'm standing there in the middle of July. It's hot. Guys, listen to me. It's hot. Sweats. Oh, my. It's almost 1 o'clock. I'll cut it down soon. God said, lay down on the grave. I looked down at that grave, and guys, it was dirty down there. I didn't want to lay down on the grave. And I said, God, you see how dirty it is down there? That's argued with God. God told me to lay down on the grave. And it's like he yelled. It, I can hear it sound. Lay down on the grave. I started bending my knees, and before I knew it, I was laying on the grave. Face down. And it felt like little electric tingles coming up out of the dirt into my body, all up and down my body. I don't know how long I laid there. But all of a sudden, it stopped. And the Spirit said, now you have it. And I went to the left and I said, now I have it. And I heard a voice on each side of me, me too. <laughs> Kevin and, and, and Dana had laid down on the grave beside me. And they had the same experience. I haven't been the same since. But when those people were telling me their stories, just before they dismissed me, they'd laid their hand on my shoulder. And they'd say a, a silent, about a 15-minute prayer. 15 minutes, 15 seconds. Well, finally I got the nerve up. It took about a year to ask signs, what are y'all doing? You know, he says, we're imputing all the anointings that we have off onto you. Now, folks, these people didn't quit working miracles. I saw hundreds and hundreds of miracles at Pisgah in those six years from those saints. They didn't stop. Now, I thought, wow, okay, because I couldn't wait till I got to uh, my section of the uh, men's dormitory and got the book. I owned a book. That the author was uh, uh, Web, you know, Webster, and I got his book out to find out what in the world impute meant. It means to transfer over. So I got all their anointings. And I thought, wow, yeah. Now, I've been talking so long. I've, but what time do I usually shut down? I can't hear you. Oh. I take some question and answers. Then I pray a prayer of impartation of the anointing unto y'all. Now, in little crowds, I may pray one-on-one, -on -one, but in big crowds, I say a corporate prayer. And I've had just as many say they felt the anointing come into them in the corporate prayers they do one-on-one. -on -one. But one-on-one, -on -one, more people get healed. Now listen, people, the people that get healed in my meetings, I didn't heal them. I am not the healer. God is. I'm an instrument. I'm a minister that God uses. But most of the people in my meetings get healed while they're sitting in their seats. I was telling the Lucille story in Albany, New York. A Jewish rabbi got me up there. He's, they're they're Mastionic, spirit filled. I'm telling about the story. And I hear a, ooh, and a jerk that says, is, is there a problem, sister? And the woman beside of Noble told me, a tooth just came in. I said, wow, I want to talk to you. It was, an, it was, it was enamel. 
He just drew in. God can do anything. He still wants to do the same with us that he did as Zeus. Now, this revival's been going on for about, well, it started in the summer, big, big time, 2010. But it's still going on. Getting bigger all the time. You say, who's it going to? I said, whoever is hungry. Whoever wants it. Now, I've been to every Pentecostal organization, and I've been to some, I've been to a couple of Methodist churches. They received it. Now, I believe that little kids can receive the same anointings that you big adults do. I don't care if you're six or 106. God will use you. The same as he will anybody else. I want to tell one more little story of a revival that broke loose in California. Five large churches, their youth groups got together. Got me up there to Banning, California. Now, at the meeting, I'm talking and finally I look down and I says, Brain, you know, would you few people please get up and let anybody that needs prayer come down here and get in this section? They did. One had a cast on him. He was one of the youth pastors. He had injured it in a ball game. I said, now, you young people, you start praying. And if God tells you to come and pray for somebody, come up here and pray. Well, about a minute went by, and finally this little girl got up and started walking down the aisle. She walked up to that man with the cast on. It was her youth pastor. Laid hands on him and prayed for him, and he got instantly healed. Yes. Yes. He got people to help him break the cast off, and he went shout. Of course, the church wouldn't up. I kept saying, y'all go ahead and shout, but bring me the little girl. Finally, I said, I want to see the little girl. Well, they brought her up to me. I got sweet again, and I got down and got her by the hands. I said, sweetheart, tell me, how old are you? She said, 13. I said, did you know that you could do that anytime, anywhere? She said, anytime, anywhere? I said, yeah. Okay. At school, on the football team, she's what you call the towel girl. Sometimes on TV, you can see these little girl, these young girls running with towels to people. That's what she done. Well, the next game, the quarterback got injured. They had him up on the gurney. She went up to him and said, I believe in divine healing. She said, I believe if I pray for you, God will heal you. Would you like for me to pray for you? And the quarterback says, uh, so she prayed for him. He got up and played in the next play. <laughs> A little while later, on defense, the quarterback, the, the linebacker got injured. Went up to him and said, he got up. It got to where when someone got injured on that football team, the coach and the doctor was a towel girl, come, come, come here, come here. <laughs> they instantly would bring her over, and it even got to where the opposing team <laughs> would ask could they have the towel girl to come over and pray. The school was going to shut her down. They even brought this poor little 13-year-old girl up front of the school board and didn't tell her parents. She let them know that they were a violation of her rights. They're in trouble. She, but besides that, go ahead and kick me out. My father was going to be so thrilled. She said, because he wants to sue you. He hopes you're a rich school district. 
She says, Do you, have you ever heard of a man by the name of Jay Sigalow? She says, check him out. Every time he takes one of these to the Supreme Court, he wins. She says, so go ahead. You'll make my daddy happy, and you're making me happy. She said, you listen to me. I have never just walked up and prayed for anybody. I asked them what they'd like for me to pray for them. And when they say yes, I pray for them, and they get healed. She turned and walked off. This is, we got off. She said, no, I'm through. Do my daddy a favor and expel me because I'm not going to stop. They took a couple of days and checked out this man named Sigalo. And they called her back in and apologized to her <laughs> and told her as long as she asked. She said, oh, my dad was getting so excited he wanted to sue Okay, listen, she left that school with that school over 90% saved. She went to junior high. Same thing. She went on to high school. Same thing. She's in college now, having the same results. You kids, God will use you to heal people. If you ever get the boldness to listen to him and obey him, he'll do it. I have seen it done in some of Steve Siler's meetings. There's a little evangelist in Oklahoma, more. God will tell him, some little kid, come up here. God tells me you pray for that woman there. She'll be healed. Kid go, they get healed. He started with the miracles in 07, 2007. He'd get up there with my book and read a couple of the miracles. And then so, and God started working miracles. I mean, just working them. And he wants to work them with you today. Now, we, can, we can't take very many question and answers unless you insist. Now, we'll need somebody with a microphone to go up to them or someone to interpret to me what they're saying. These lights are bright. I can't see them talking. I need to understand and know what they're asking. I don't want to give some stupid, ignorant answer when I, because I didn't know what they were saying. Anyone got a question? Oh, nobody. So we can go right to the fair. Oh, yes, right there. What do you see as the greatest hindrance to bringing healing to people? What, what do you think is the biggest roadblock? What is the biggest roadblock or hindrance to seeing miracles released? What is released? the biggest what? Hindrance or roadblocks to miracles. Things that stop miracles or don't allow miracles to happen. What's the biggest hindrance? I'm still not... I know about miracles, but... What, she's asking, what's the biggest problem that creates an atmosphere so miracles don't happen? What's the biggest hindrance or Unbelief. roadblock? Unbelief. Not the lack of faith. Everybody has some faith. They don't believe it's going to happen. And what you're doing is you, you don't believe what the Word says. What does the Word say? You're healed. If you get healed... You were healed 2,000 years ago. You're just now believing, and it manifests. But listen, in the Old Testament, it says, by his stripes, we are healed. In the New Testament, it says, by his stripes, we were healed. We just got to get faith and belief. Jesus said, don't worry. Don't, don't be afraid. Only believe. Believe God will do. Why was Mo, uh, Abraham, what was counted to Abraham for righteousness? That he had faith? No. He believed God. 
But that's the biggest hindrance. But then Azusa Street, see, God sees your faithfulness, and you'll start seeing manifestations. Uh, I've been in Randy Clark meetings. I didn't, I've, I've not seen very much manifestation. Healings galore. Now, up in Redding, California, with Bill Johnson, you see a lot of uh, signs. I mean, he has a lot of weird stuff, you know. You say, do you believe in that? And I says, yeah. Signs and wonders. People see this stuff, and their belief increases. Their faith increases. They're in the Shekinah glory. If, if, if your floor filled up with Shekinah glory, don't you think you'd start getting some more faith? <laughs> and it'd be much easier for you to believe? All you'll need to do, folks, is get one or two miracles, and people see it, they start believing more. Now, I had an advantage at 17 years old. Being with these people, I lived with them, I worked with them, I ate with them, I went to church with them, and I mimicked them. That means I copied what they done. We sat in church, if one of them, I'd be looking at them. If one of them went, I'd go. <laughs> if one of those women had bobbed their head, I'd bob mine. I never failed. The morning of God followed me, and the power of God followed, I'd get all excited. Now, at 17, I would. People were getting healed. People were getting healed. Why? I seen them getting healed, so I had the faith and I believed. When you start seeing something, it's easy to get it. It's just to get it going. But listen, don't stop praying for people. You ever heard of the happy hunters? First man that Francis prayed for, he died. She got all mad, but God says, keep praying. She kept praying. And there's an older couple already retired. They started having miracles galore. They've gone on to be with the Lord now, but their daughter, Joan, has a bigger ministry than they do. And she started up healing rooms with the assemblies of God all over the world. You have some that are starting up these kid healing rooms. God will use you kids, believe me. He will use you. Usually the kids can have more faith than us adults. You get one convinced, and you let one of them see a healing, and the others will join right in quicker than we do. That's why God said, have childlike faith. Now, any other questions? Let's go into a time of doing impartation. Yeah, Let's stir up the impartation stuff now. Huh? Let's, let's stir up the impartation and the expectation. Does that sound good? Oh. Uh, I'd like to pray a corporate over these, but I want to pray for each one of these kids. Yes, yes. Can That's I? Good. Absolutely. I want to lay hands on them. Yes. Well, should we scoot your, we'll scoot your chair a little closer? <laughs> we'll move your chair a little closer to the edge. No, I want to get down there and sit down on that field. Okay. And have room for perfect. You know, let's just, let's, let's engage our hearts with the Lord right now. Come on, you guys, we just heard so many amazing testimonies. So he's going to pray for the children and we just want to engage our hearts with, with God as he stirred up faith. I'm going to lay my hands 
on your shoulder, left shoulder, and my right hand on your head, and I'm going to pray a prayer of invitation of the anointing that I have. I'm going to put them up onto you so you can work miracles. Is that all right? Yeah, I like it. <laughs> okay, who wants to be first? Jesus' name. I'm asking now, God supernaturally, but by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that an importation of the same anointings I've got that I got, got at Azusa Street when I when I lay down on Seymour's grave, and God, when those Azusa Street saints put their hands on my shoulder and imparted that anointing, I impart it to this young man now in Jesus' name. God, I'm asking you to move with an impartation of the anointing now upon this young lady. Does she receive the anointings that I have that I got from the Azusa Saints and from Brother Seymour in Jesus' name? Yeah, come on. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Hi. God, I'm asking your anointing come upon this young man supernaturally. God, let him receive an experience yeah. of the anointing and of the Holy Ghost. God, that he received the anointings that I received from Azusa Street, saints, and that I received from Seymour in Jesus' name. God, let your anointing come up on this young man, a supernatural anointing to receive what I have received of the anointings that I got from the Azusa saints and from Brother Seymour in Jesus' name. real careful when you, when you chew it on your fingernails you might bite it off <laughs> God I'm asking you move for this young man right now by your spirit God that the anointing come upon him the same anointings I received from the Azusa Saints and that I received from Seymour in Jesus name hi how old are you nine wow I used to be that way Okay, now listen. I've seen many kids at Azusa Street as young as six getting people healed out of wheelchairs. He can do the same for you. Yeah. God, I'm asking an anointing come up on her right now that she receive it supernaturally. God, an anointing that I received from those saints and from Brother Seymour, I'm asking you impart it to her now in Jesus' name. Do I pray for you first or her? Okay, come here. God, I ask you to move right now for this young woman. Right now, let your anointing fall upon her for her to receive that anointing that I received at Azusa Street from the Azusa Street Saints and from Seymour in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Now, I'm going to pray for you, okay? I'll, I'll be real gentle, okay? I won't be. God, I ask you to move for this young lady. That I receive the anointing, God, that I receive from the Azusa Saints and from Seymour in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hi. Come here. Yeah. God, in Jesus' name, I ask you to move on this little girl right now. Let her receive a special anointing. God, the same ones that I received. From the Azusa Saints and from Brother Seymour, in Jesus' name. Mm. Hi, how old are you? Twelve. You're how old? Twelve. Wow. Come here. I know many mis ministers that used to preach and do all kinds of miracles at twelve. God, I'm asking you move now for this young woman. Right now, God, that the anointings that I receive from the Azusa Saints and God that I received from Seymour in Jesus' name. Hi. 
Are you ready to heal people? Yeah. God, I'm asking you move right now by your anointing to let her receive that anointing. All the anointings that I received from the Azusa Street Saints and from Brother Seymour in Jesus' name. Hi. How old are you? Ten. 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 Wow, I was that way about 60 years ago. Yeah. God, in Jesus' name. God, I, I ask now, as I see her laying hands on young people and they getting healed, I'm asking now that you move upon her supernaturally. Let her receive the anointings that I have. God, that I got from the Azusa Saints, that I got from Seymour when I laid on his grave. In Jesus' name. Hi. Do you understand what I'm saying when I pray for an anointing? Good. God, I'm asking you to move upon her now for an importation of the anointing that I received, all of them that I received from the Azusa Saint and that I received from William Seymour when I laid on his grave. In Jesus' name. Hi. Hi. And my pretty boots. I'm looking here where I can look and see your face because them lights are blinding me. <laughs> okay, how, how old are you? I'm 13. Huh? 13. 13. Mm -hmm. that, uh, God, in Jesus' name, you move right now. For this young lady, let her receive the faith and talk to her. That she'll hear from you and she'll receive the anointings that I received from all those Azusa saints and from Seymour when I laid on his grave. In Jesus' name. Yeah. And all because I'm here. Yeah. Now, how old are you? Twelve. Twelve. Wow. God in Jesus' name, move right now for this young lady. Let her an importation of those anointings come upon her that I received from those Azusa Straits saints and from Brother Seymour in Jesus' name. God, I'm asking you and put the anointing upon him that I received from the Azusa Saints and that I received from Brother Seymour in Jesus' name. How old are you? Fourteen. Fourteen. Well, you're almost grown. <laughs> God, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to move supernaturally with a supernatural anointing the same what God I got from those Azusa saints that I received when I laid on Seymour's grave. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, folks, you young people, listen to me. I have, I, I'm ready to get under the anointing. So you're getting those anointings. I'm feeling it. I'm glad I'm sitting down right now. <laughs> God, in the name of Jesus, let your anointing fall. Thou that he received the same anointings that I have received from the Azusa Saints and that I received from Brother Seymour in Jesus' name. Hi. Silence. I keep cool. Do you? You keep cool. I do most of the time. Once in a while I get excited. God, I'm asking right now you move for this young man with a supernatural anointings that I received from the Azusa Street Saints and that I received from Seymour when I laid on his grave in Jesus' name. Boy, this is a biggie. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> oh, God, I ask you to bless this kid. Let him grow up knowing what your word says. And God, that he'll start getting, is it she or he? He. That he'll start getting the desire to do what the biggies are doing and he'll have an anointing of the Azusa Saints and the same anointing that God from Seymour in Jesus' name. Yeah. 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 God, in Jesus' name, I ask you to move upon this little girl. Let her receive the same anointings I've received 
from the Azusa Saints. <laughs> and then I received when I laid on Seaboard's grave, in Jesus' name, yes. to say a prayer, okay? God, I'm asking you to move this young man, that your anointings fall upon him, that he receive the same anointings that I received from the Azusa Saints, and that I received from Seymour's grave, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Look at this, yes. Oh, yeah. Lord, I'm asking now that you move for this child that receive the anointings, God, and it grows up to wanting of anointings and impart the anointings on it now that I receive from the Azusa Saints and I receive from Brother Seymour in Jesus' name. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the, one, the one in the womb. God, in Jesus' name. I'm asking this child now while still in the womb to receive the anointings the same ones I received at Azusa Street and that I received when I laid on Seymour's grave, that it, God, that it be filled with the Holy Spirit and it grow up, God, under the anointing in Jesus' name. That's happened in the Bible, folks. I know. Same thing. Oh. <laughs> God, I want you to read right now in Jesus' name. Let your anointing flow to this child. God, to this child now, that it receive the same anointings I received at Azusa Street, the same anointings that I received from Brother Seymour when I laid on his grave, in Jesus' name, and I ask that, God, it be filled with the Holy Spirit now, in Jesus' name. Hey, if John the Baptist could get it while still in the womb, so can they. That's right. Hi. You're not pregnant, are you? Okay. <laughs> I had to do that. <laughs> God, I'm asking you right now, move upon this young woman. I'm asking your anointing fall, and that she receive the same anointings that I have. She receives them, and she receives the ones when I got from Seymour when I laid on his grave. In Jesus' name. Yes. Yes. Come a little closer. Okay. Heavenly Father, I'm asking that your anointing fall. Let her receive the same anointings that I received from the Azusa Saints and that I received when I laid on Brother Seymour's grave in Jesus' name. Now you notice I don't say long prayers. I just never got to say it, it'll happen. God, I'm asking you to move from this young man right now with the supernatural anointings. God, that I got from the the Azusa Street Saints, and that I got from William Seymour's grave. Anointing fall. Is that when you was born? No. <laughs> God, in Jesus' name, I'm asking your, your anointing in a special way, fall upon this young man. Let him receive the reality that he has it and that he can do the same thing as they done, that these anointings fall upon him that I received from the Azusa Saints and that I received when I laid on Seymour's grave. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Glory. Now, young folks, listen to me. I'm serious. I've seen little kids get people healed. They're doing it already. I've seen it done. You can do it too. I pray now that your parents will encourage you. Now, don't be foolish, but if you hear a voice in here, now not up here, Satan can talk up there too, but he can't talk here. God does. To tell you to lay hands. But don't just walk over, ask them if they can, and then pray for them. And when you start seeing people get healed, it'll really be fun. Yeah. Now, I want, there's too many of y'all. 
I made a mistake with a crowd of 10,000. I said, everybody wants the anointing. Come up here. Every one of them got up. And I looked at a guy and I says, what do I do? He says, I do a corporate prayer. He says, we don't have six months to do all this. <clears throat> and I agreed with him. I, uh, I did that once not too long ago at a Hispanic church in Round Rock, Texas. It's just a community of Austin. Hundreds of them just got up. I said, uh, who uh, come up here in front? <laughs> And I prayed a prayer for them. I've had some just, sta just you know, stand and I'll pray. Listen, there's no limit to the anointing. Right. Never limit God. Yeah. But use some wisdom. I'm not that young anymore. There was a time when I could have run up here and jumped up on this platform. That was quite a few years ago. I want to tell one little story to you people here. You know, about 19, 20 years, it was 20 years ago that Randy Clark had that outpouring in Toronto. A couple outside of there, from that revival, two brothers, they had 750 acres apiece, that's 1,500 acres of land, were going to build a church on their property. The husband's down driving a stake in there where they're going to start. The wife's out there filming it. Well, the brother sees something, and he, uh, the wife... He runs back in, gets his camera equipment, and takes a picture of it. They send it to me and ask me, is this the Shekinah glory? Over this woman's head is this huge glory cloud. I got on the phone right then and called them when I got the, when I got the letter. And I said, that definitely looks just like it. I said, and you're asking could this be a sign? I says, well, I think it definitely is. Yeah. You're building a church, and here's the sky of glory over you. That's good. I said, glory. Yeah, yeah. Build the church. <laughs> and yes, that's the glory. Why does it happen all the time? I don't know. Ask God. I have had hundreds of deaf people healed in my meetings, and I wear hearing aids. I do not know how to answer that. The first time I met Bill Johnson, his wife was with him. They came down from Reading, knowing I was in the area, and found me. I was at a Randy Clark meeting. I was fixing to go home. I'd been some of my own. His wife had back problems, and they couldn't get her healed up there in Bethel. I understood. She, but he said, she said to him, if I get down to Tommy Walsh and he lays hands on my back, I'll be healed. I said, glory. Well, I wanted Bill to lay his hands on her back, and I lay my hands on her back, and I want to lay it down that, that far down her back. He said, no, you lay your hands on her and get her healed. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I, laid, I laid hands on her, prayed for her, she got healed. Come on. Yeah. You know what Bill did? He said, now me. I said, what's wrong with you? He says, Nothing. I want your anointing. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh. I said, well, while I'm praying for you to get my anointing, I'm going to get yours. He says, good. <laughs> I laid hands on his bald head and went to praying. And see, I had my hand on that left shoulder. That's to guide you or keep you from falling if I can. Well, I couldn't, so I guided him around, let him fall on the sofa. <laughs> he got up and he says, you got an anointing. I said, yeah, you do too. I can't explain all things that God does. I, I don't know. Uh, I've had some great healings. I used to couldn't even walk on this knee not too long ago. And I went up to Prayer Mountain to speak for Billy Brim. And I stayed in one of those cabins up there. As soon as this knee crossed that threshold of the cabin, it quit wow, come on. hurting. I was about ready to get me a cane or a crutch. It was arthritis. I've not taken any arthritis pain medicine or any other since. I don't know why God does it in different ways. I think with me, it's to kind of keep me humble. God's the healer, Amen. not me. He just uses you. Now, all of you that want the anointing, stand up.
Glory. Yeah. Yes. Heavenly Father, now I'm asking that your anointing start falling all over this place. That these people receive the same anointings that I receive from the Azusa saints that I received when I laid down on Seymour's grave. I am part those anointings offered to all of them now in Jesus' name. Now that's a simple prayer. I believe God heard it and answered it. Will all of you get it? I don't know. But every one of you got something. But I believe some of you start praying for people. And you'll start seeing some results. Now if you start praying, I love that song. Shekinah glory come. I first heard it at the Hispanic church in Round Rock, Texas there. It, it thrilled my socks off of me almost. Probably would have if I didn't have my shoes on. Yes, Shekinah glory come. Come, come, come. Do you have to have it to see healings? No. But when they had it at Azusa and other places when that Shekinah glory is there, the healings come in abundance. Wow. So God, we thank you for new dimensions, God. Lord, we even celebrate the, the miracles and healings that we've seen in this place. But we say, God, we've crossed a threshold into the newer, into the extraordinary. And God, I thank you for Brother Tommy and his heart and his willingness to be with us this morning, God. To share the stories, the testimonies, because it's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony that we overcome the accuser, the dark one. And God, I just pray and release great grace over Tommy and the rest of his time here in Wisconsin. And God, I say, let us be stirred with faith in new ways, God. That as we believe, we will see your reality. And we bless you, God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you.